Presented by Caltech. So we have a brand new regulator. So this should work now. Indeed it does. So I can show you what I wanted to show you last time. So I have a motor on this. So now we have a motor that's driving the one end of the spring. And you can kind of see that this is more or less following the motion of the uh, motor, the driving force. So let me change the frequency. I, I change the, so, you know, frequency of this oscillation. I'm going to increase it. Increase it. I am going to go fairly fast. And once things settle down, so the amplitude's increased, uh, but it should just uh, start it from rest. So now you see, so the amplitude may be not so different than before, uh, but if you look closely, now you see that when this is going this way, this tends to be going this way. So before they were going together, I increased the frequency and now they tend to go in the opposite direction. At least I hope they are. Let me change the frequency to an intermediate value between those two. Okay, this is somewhere in between. And the most obvious thing is that the amplitude has gotten a lot bigger. And so we derived this equation last time that says in response to a driving force, which is that last term there, the amplitude looks like it's going to get bigger if you get closer to the natural frequency of the oscillator, just roughly speaking at least. And so that's presumably what I did here was I got close to the natural frequency of this oscillator. And now it's the transient response happening, which should be at roughly the natural frequency of the oscillator. There's a small correction for the damping. Okay. So I also wanted to show you this time, simplified the setup. So now all we have is a driving voltage so this is the same circuit we had before except now I'm just going to look at the driving voltage which is green And the voltage across the capacitor in a very simple way so that it works better, which is in cyan. I guess that's cyan. Is that cyan? Okay. Um, <clears throat> okay, so right now this driving voltage is, um, oh, it's one volt RMS. It's a one kilohertz frequency. And you can see the response across the capacitor is pretty much in phase with it. It's a smaller voltage, but it's pretty much in phase. Now, if I change the frequency, let's go to two kilohertz, three kilohertz, four kilohertz, 
So you can see the frequency is increasing, of course. Five kilohertz. So between here and here, it's pretty clear now that the voltage across the capacitor is increasing. Five kilohertz, six kilohertz, off scale. Seven kilohertz, it's coming back down. Eight kilohertz. And notice something about the phase. The phase here for the voltage across the capacitor is out of phase now, 180 degrees out of phase with the voltage that I'm driving this system with. So very low frequencies, I had things kind of in phase. Very high frequencies, I had things out of phase, the capacitor, voltage across the capacitor. In the middle, we had something like resonance. Uh, and the phase is somewhere in between those. I'm not really exactly at resonance, maybe. Um, it's maybe a little better. So I'm closer to resonance there, it got bigger. Um, and now you can see that the, the, uh, the capacitor voltage is crossing zero at roughly where the uh, maximum of the driving voltage is in one direction or the other. So I'm roughly pi over two out of phase now. I could add more damping, of course, and make this come down. Uh, maybe not quite so much. See, as I go through phase, you can through 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 this where the peak is the highest. You can see how the phase is shifting. Relative shape phase. Okay, question. Okay, so those are the demonstrations I wanted to do. This is, in fact, a timely way, time to do it. Um, let me uh, get rid of that for now and turn off this noise. It's all damped down now. <clears throat> I'll come back to these other things later. Uh, they're kind of the next subject. But I want to do a little more analysis of our solution up here. So that's our general solution for our damped driven harmonic oscillator. You know, we've got, we've done the whole thing now. Uh, but I'd like to kind of understand it a little better. So let's see. So we've looked at the transient response. That's the solution to the homogeneous equation that's, that's first. That's the solution to the, to the equation where there's no driving, no driving force. So we looked at that already. We talked about critical damping and so forth. Let's look at just the steady state motion that is the last term that's the response to the driving force. Okay. So let's consider long times where the transient has died down. So for T much, much bigger than two over gamma, that first term goes away because it's got an E to the minus gamma T over two damping on it. And so it's E to a very small number now. In that case, we have X of T is just A naught divided by omega naught squared minus omega squared plus I omega gamma E to the I omega T. Of course, it's the real part of this that, that we're actually observing, right? So let me take the real part. And that'll give us the solution that we're actually interested in. <clears throat> so let's consider the amplitude factor. Okay. 
I want to write this amplitude factor in a way that's, that's uh, well, times a naught, but I'm going to leave off the a naught for now. So a, a, a zero is a real number by assumption. Okay, so this has a magnitude in the face. So let me call the magnitude C, and let me call the phase e to the minus i delta. So we're defining things such that this really is a magnitude, that is, it's a non-negative number, okay? So if, if, if this goes negative, then it's because of this e to the i delta, okay, for example. The sign convention here is, is chosen to agree with the book. That is, this is the phase lag of the displacement behind the driving force. Okay, so I want to find C and I want to find delta. I want to know what those things are because I want to, you know, I, I want to write this factor in, in this form and this factor is already in the form of the I phase and so then I can separate out amplitude and phase in a, in a uh, convenient way. I can, I can separate the, out the real and imaginary parts. So it's easier to, you know, Working with one over something, so you know, of course, to get the magnitude, I have to take the absolute square of the quantity and so forth. Uh, and well, I have to, I have to do what I'm going to do here. It's easier to work with one over something that's in the denominator, so let's do that. Omega naught squared minus omega squared plus i omega gamma is equal to one over the other side, which is one over C times E to the I delta. Okay. <clears throat> so to get the magnitude, I'll take the absolute square. <clears throat> so I get, when I take the absolute square on this side, I just get one over C squared. C is not negative, uh, is, is uh, a real number, of course. Um, and then I have to equate that to taking this times its complex conjugate. Okay, so I've just taken the absolute square of both sides because I, what I want is the magnitude here then I'll worry about the phase. And so when I multiply this out, I get omega naught squared minus omega squared squared plus omega squared gamma squared. All right. And so therefore, my magnitude C is just equal to one over so it's going to be the square root of this. So the square root of that is omega naught squared minus omega squared squared plus omega squared gamma squared. <coughs> and so if I take that times a zero, I get the, the magnitude that, of the motion. Now for the phase. Okay. <clears throat> I mean, people often have uh, more difficulty with with uh, phases, but uh, just go slowly and be patient and and. Uh, make sure that you uh, think about it enough to, to do it logically. So e to the i delta, 
Um, it's just going to be, so it's just going to be C times that, okay? So that's uh, C times omega naught squared minus omega squared <coughs> uh, plus I omega gamma. <coughs> so that has a real and imaginary part, as it should in general. It's a phase, it's a phase factor. Um, of course, we've picked C such that it'll have modulus one. It's, that's guaranteed now. Um, and so, how can we look at this? Let me draw a triangle, a right triangle, and pick the x-axis to be along the real direction and the y-axis to be along the imaginary direction. And so, this has length omega naught squared minus omega squared, and this has a length omega gamma up, up to a common factor. Okay, and so uh, the vertex here is, I mean, I can put the C times this if you like. So the vertex has coordinates C omega naught squared minus omega squared times M and C omega gamma. Okay. And the angle in here is just delta. I'm just describing this point in my complex plane uh, using this triangle. The uh, real part and imaginary part in the phase delta giving the uh, appropriate angle. <coughs> so I get delta is just the inverse tangent of the opposite over the adjacent. Modulo pi, say. Uh, and so therefore we have x of t, putting this all back together, x of t is a naught divided by this factor uh, omega naught squared minus omega squared squared plus omega squared gamma squared that we determined up there times an e to the i omega t minus delta where delta is given by this. I'm not going to write that expression in my exponential there. Okay. But so now we've separated this into a magnitude part and a phase part. <coughs> Let's see, not here. <coughs> so let me. Uh, So F naught, if you remember, uh, when we wrote down the differential equation, we defined F naught to be A naught over M, because we defined it through by M. That's the difference between A naught and F naught. So this driving force, I've written it there with a particular phase, but it could have some other phase. So let me add that feature. Okay. So in general, A naught could also have a phase on it from the driving force, e to the i phi. And so I should add that to the, uh, so I could take this A naught and write the magnitude of A naught 
and put the phi up here plus phi. Okay. And so then I take the real part. After doing that, and I get x of t is equal to the magnitude of a naught divided by omega naught squared minus omega squared squared plus omega squared gamma squared times taking the real part, so the exponential is an exponential of e to the i omega t minus delta plus phi. Take the real part of that, I just get the cosine. Cosine omega t minus delta plus phi. Okay, so that takes into account the possible phase uh, of the driving force. Well, quite often we just sufficient to take uh, phi equals zero. <clears throat> so a naught and phi are properties of the driving force. They're related to the amplitude and phase of the driving force. So specifying the driving force specifies those two quantities. So, let, so let's now investigate. So we've, we've got the solution. Let's investigate its behavior. Um, let's just consider for simplicity phi equals zero. It doesn't really matter unless we really care about some particular problem where it comes in. Uh, and then uh, and, let, and then let's just let, uh, and, and then a naught is just equal to a dot in this case, okay? And it's a number bigger than zero because we've chosen the phase to be zero, okay? <clears throat> so that just simplifies my life in writing things down, okay? So the driving force With this phase choice, it's just F naught, where F naught is bigger than zero, cosine omega t. <clears throat> so we've defined A naught to be equal to F naught over M. And so this corresponds to what the amplitude of the driving motion is as follows. So let's let, let A be the amplitude of the driving motion. You know, it's how far this is moving to its extreme, okay? Or the peak value of the voltage on the, on the driving of the power supply over there, the sinusoidal signal generator. So let's see. So stretching the spring A certain distance in a way um, corresponds to a force of just k times a. That's the spring constant. Yeah. Oh, did I? <laughs> Oops. The board above is a mistake. 
because you write down the force equation, you have m x double dot plus is equal to f naught e to the i omega t. I divide through by m, I get f naught over m, I call that a naught. So, what do I do with the eraser that I like? Oh, got hidden. <sighs> So, thank you. I knew it was a ratio of one thing to the other, and I guessed the wrong one. Okay. So, this is A naught here. <clears throat> okay, so therefore, A naught, which is F naught over M, is just K A over M, which is just omega naught squared A. So now we could write things in terms of the actual amplitude of the driving force, which is often a useful thing to do. In particular, I might want to see how the amplitude of my motion varies in some absolute sense that is compared or relative sense comparing with the amplitude of the driving force. Um, so we also have that I can write x of t is equal to a omega naught squared divided by this stuff we get tired of writing after a while, but okay, it's important. <coughs> Cosine omega t minus delta. So if this number is smaller than one, we get motion that's smaller than the driving motion. If this number is bigger than one, we get motion that's bigger than the driving motion. <coughs> So let's consider gamma goes to zero. Let's suppose there's no damping in the system. So in that case, x of t is the limit as gamma goes to zero of, of this. Let me not write it down again since I just wrote it. Uh, which is equal to a omega naught squared, and then this goes to zero. This is a square, which I take the positive root of, times the limit as gamma goes to zero of cosine omega t minus delta. Remember, delta is a function of gamma. So I have to take the limit on this too. I, mean, I just wrote it as delta, but it's actually a function of gamma. Delta equals this arctangent involving gamma. So I just have to be a little careful. <clears throat> okay, what do I do with that? So tangent of Delta equals omega gamma over omega naught squared minus omega squared. As gamma goes to zero, this goes to zero if omega naught squared is greater than omega squared. So that's straightforward if uh, you can, you can see it in my triangle up here. If I let gamma go to zero, this collapses down on delta equals zero. But I have to be a little careful if this quantity here is negative, which I didn't really worry about yet, but now I have to worry about it. <clears throat> 
So in that case, our triangle looks like this. So the, a, sign, a, a side that has a positive uh, size is, it goes in a negative direction now. Omega gamma, this distance is pi minus delta. And so my, uh, <coughs> um, so my tangent is a tangent of pi minus delta is equal to omega gamma over omega squared minus omega naught squared. And so delta, as gamma goes to zero, delta is going to approach pi. Uh, okay, so, uh, so I can put us all together. So, uh, so the cosine omega t minus delta, in this case, uh, you add a pi there instead of zero, and so you get a minus goes as gamma goes to zero, goes to minus cosine omega t. And so I can summarize that we get x of t is equal to a omega naught squared divided by omega naught squared minus omega, it's really hard to write down there, cosine omega t. <clears throat> if you can read that. And that takes into account the sign. Okay, so that works for, uh, that works whether omega naught is bigger than omega or, or less than. You can see that flips the sign there. <clears throat> so, I want to move that there. What the heck? So let's see what happens now. If the driving frequency is equal to the natural frequency, the coefficient in front of the cosine omega t blows up. Okay. We get that the amplitude goes to infinity. For omega goes to zero, x of t will just go to a. That is, if we go to the limit of zero frequency, we're just going to end up with whatever our displacement was at zero frequency. For omega goes to infinity, we have infinity in the denominator here. And so the amplitude is going to go to zero. So our oscillator frequency response as a curve of amplitude versus frequency looks something like this. If I put omega naught here, then, so the maximum value of x, so the amplitude of the motion for x, starts out at a here, goes off to infinity somehow, and on the other side of omega naught comes down from infinity and approaches zero. So that's a graph of the frequency response of an undamped harmonic oscillator. Of course, we never have a truly undamped oscillator in reality. Uh, and so we really should consider the damping. Um, so for 
gamma not equal to zero, so more realistic situation, uh, we have our solution x of t is equal to a omega naught squared divided by the square root of omega naught squared minus omega squared plus omega squared gamma squared times cosine omega t minus delta. So let's, this is the amplitude out front. I mean, this has uh, amplitude one, okay? So this is, where, this is where the size of the motion is. Let's call it uh, A of omega, and that's certainly a number, non-negative number, okay? And so we can ask some questions with the damping about the behavior of a omega as a function of omega. That is the frequency, the frequency response of a damped harmonic oscillator. <coughs> Let's see. Where does it achieve a maximum? as a function of frequency. So we'll call them frequency where A of omega is a maximum, call it A max at omega max. So there's some frequency omega max where this amplitude is, is largest, okay? I mean, there it happens to be omega naught, but uh, it's uh, maybe won't be the same thing. So this occurs when zero is d by d omega of, well, I only need it to, the only omega dependence is in the denominator there, so I can, uh, I c you know, I could write d by d omega of that factor, but I don't need to. Let's, let's keep our lives as simple as possible. Life is hard enough as it is. So zero is that derivative. Uh, equals to omega naught squared minus omega squared times two omega plus two omega gamma squared. So we solve that equation for omega. It's just a simple quadratic equation, uh, solve it for omega max squared in particular, it makes it easier, is omega naught squared, because I could divide out the two omega there, yeah. Okay, omega naught squared minus gamma squared over two, so it's actually quite easy. Okay, <clears throat> you can compare this with our transient frequency from the transient response where we had this frequency omega one squared that the transient behaved as, that was omega naught squared minus gamma squared over four. So, in the limit of no damping, it's the same. It's at omega naught, it's at the natural frequency, but with damping, it's similar to this, but it's not quite the same thing. So I don't think it's gonna be the same place. Um, so, here. What's the value of the amplitude at the maximum? That's A max. That's just A at this maximum frequency. Um, A omega naught squared, square root of omega naught squared minus omega max squared squared plus 
omega of x squared times gamma squared. And so I have to plug in omega naught squared minus gamma squared over 4 here. So the omega naught squared cancels that. So I just get a gamma squared over 4 squared. Uh, and then I'll get another gamma squared times a gamma squared there. So I'll cancel part of it. And to make a long story short, this is equal to a times omega naught squared divided by um, gamma, we pull the gamma out front, omega naught squared minus gamma squared over 4. Or I can rewrite this in a somewhat useful form as a times omega naught over gamma, 1 over square root of 1 minus gamma over 2 omega naught squared. And now I've written it in such a way that I have a nice parameter. Instead of omega naught and gamma, I have a single parameter that I can use here. This is just Q. This is just uh, 1 over 2Q. Remember, Q is defined as omega naught over gamma by my quality factor. And so as Q is much, much bigger than 1, if, it, if, if if you have Q much bigger than 1, then this maximum, um, this maximum, so the square root goes away if Q is much bigger than 1, you just have A times Q. So in the limit of high Q, uh, the amplitude of the motion is just the driving motion times Q, driving amplitude times Q. Um, so we say we have a resonance at omega equals omega max. That's the, where the peak of the resonance is. And, and so the shape of the frequency response, uh, which I'll uh, do next time, is, is, is what we call a resonance shape. Just the shape of, of uh, that curve is a function of frequency of, of this amplitude. But, but there's a problem here. What if omega naught squared is less than gamma squared over 4? or gamma squared over, is it 4? Actually, I want it even to be gamma squared over, let's see, where did I have that? Gamma squared omega 1 squared. Here, this one. I was looking at the wrong one here. Uh, and that's still right, I guess, but, but this one, if, if omega naught squared is less than gamma squared over 2, I get a negative number here. And so my omega squared max is negative. Omega squared, omega max is imaginary. Something went wrong. Okay. Well, you have to go back and look and see what we did. We found the ma omega max by taking this derivative and setting it equal to zero. But what if that derivative doesn't, can't equal zero anywhere for a physical omega? Then you have to go back and realize that, oh, in that case, the maximum amplitude is occurring at a frequency of zero, at the, the physical extreme of your frequency. So, effectively, no solution in this case to d by d omega is equal to zero because it's imaginary, so we say it's no solution, no real solution. Instead,
omega, omega max is equal to zero. And so this is something that uh, I'll let you uh, go back to the original equation for what the amplitude is as a function of omega and see in this case, omega max must be equal to zero. So I'll let you convince yourself of that. And then omega a max is equal to a of zero is equal to a. That is the damping is sufficient to prevent the growth of the motion. The damping, so, I mean, obviously this corresponds to a fairly large damping in some sense. Uh, and so it's sufficiently large that actually you don't get the motion growing. In fact, you get, so, whoops, frequency response, omega. Amplitude is a function of omega. So as, as omega goes to zero, we, we know that all of our frequency response goes to A, okay? The usual case looks something like that. That's our resonance curve. But in this case, we have possibly curves that look like this. So A is actually the maximum amplitude. And I'll show it in a better picture next time. But uh, that's basically what's going on. Um, the book doesn't talk about this because the book basically assumes very early on that we have very light damping. Okay? So they don't get into this regime. But it's there. So I want to spend the last few minutes with a couple other toys. Um, here's a toy. It's just a kind of an inverted pendulum with springiness. So it's a spring and a pendulum somehow. And it's got to go with both gravity and the, well, it's a spring. Okay. Uh, but what happened? I didn't do anything to that other ball. But it's moving. And in fact, it's probably moving more than the ball I started with now. The ball I started with is almost at rest and the other ball's moving. And if the motion keeps up long enough, the first ball's gonna start moving again, which it is. So, th so this is a case where I have two oscillators got two oscillators. There are two independent degrees of freedom here. You know, I can put this one over there and that one over there if I want. Uh, but they're coupled. There's a spring down here that's coupling them. This time I kind of started out as best I could together. And up to the fact that I'm not perfect, they stay going together for quite a while. I'm not perfect, so they're going to go, go off. I gotta do something like this too. And they'll flip back and forth like this for a long time, except that I'm probably not perfect. I didn't get them the same distance. But we're seeing an example of you know motion where the motion's coupled, but if I pick the right initial conditions, I can find motion in the system that's not coupled. Something called normal modes. So here's another case of <clears throat> I've got a tuning fork, a tuning fork with essentially the same frequency here. It's got a little ping pong ball that's been painted black leaning against it here. So I'm just gonna hit this and bring it close. can see the thing moves. Oh, I didn't do that one. So you got that one. Okay. Get 
gets pretty excited. Okay. So there's some kind of coupling between, you know, I'm, I'm not touching that. There's some kind of coupling between the sound waves that this is producing and that this is receiving, and so it's making that, that move. One more toy. So I have a mass on a spring. So let me pull it and let it go. There's another degree of freedom there. So it's got both the up and down degree of freedom and it's got a rotational degree of freedom. Now you see it's not moving up and down at all hardly. It's all in the back, the twisting motion. And now it's gonna start going back up and down again. And the twisting motion stops. And then I go, this is a really neat gadget. goes back and forth that way. So the two degrees of freedom in here, they're coupled to each other when you analyze it this way. So that's the next thing we have to do after we're, I have a little bit more to do on this uh, uh, single oscillator, but then we're gonna consider coupling oscillators together and see what, we, and, and see what happens. We'll talk about normal modes uh, and then we'll get the waves. We'll get the waves from there. So that's the program.